Hello, Green. All right, so let's call to order our update. Does anybody have any changes to our update agenda tonight? What about the formal meeting agenda? No changes for staff. No changes. If there is time tonight at the update and uh, there's interest by council, um, both chiefs could potentially talk about uh, fireworks since I got several emails about that. But again, I'll leave up to council if there's interest in talking about it in the course of this time. Great, thank you. Uh, I I have a question because um, it was yeah. on the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's the right or not, but on the somebody pointed out to me that uh, public hearings, right, section eleven. Mm -hmm. says, um, uh, the first public hearing will begin at or before seven thirty, or as soon as thereafter possible. Just want to make sure that, like, that leaves enough time for the four hour of public comment. I think it does. Is that there's no issues there? Right? Did it say that it would start by seven thirty on online somewhere? Where was That's that stated? Standard so, oh, Okay. The first public hearing will begin at or before seven thirty p.m. Okay. I I didn't think. I feel like that's we don't always get there. started by 7 30 though is the yeah. that's that would be a question i would say for brett and Kristen because most of the time we don't even get through public comment book by 7 30. yeah um that's in the council's rules of order and procedure and sure. so that's why it's on the agenda okay. but it does say or there after assume thereafter is okay. Okay. So. okay all right that makes sense do you think we should change that i'm just wondering yeah. It's not enough to take care of it, really. It says as soon as possible. It says as soon as possible. But you could change it. But okay. It's broad enough as it is. It's broad. Okay. If it's broad enough, we're good to go then. Well, total concern, Brenda. Please. Thank you. Okay. So we have three briefings tonight. The first one is a review of nonprofit funding requests from Adams County Regional Economic Partnership. Stout Street Foundation and Bullying Recovery Resource Center fundraising events. Thank you, Mary. Members of City Council, we have uh, several uh, free requests for me to go over. And I will, um, I'll try not to reiterate this. You've seen it so many times. Uh, so I'll, I'm just going to skim through it. But the three requests are from Adams County Regional Economic Partnership, Stout Street Foundation and a new uh, nonprofit bullying recovery resource center. Again, the reason we bring these back to you is uh, it comes out of an ordinance where you establish uh, your travel training and other business matters. The uh, three requests we have uh, from Adams County uh, Regional Partnership, Economic Partnership, excuse me, is their annual golf tournament and it, it is a whole sponsorship um, this really is just a sponsorship. The $500 is for recognition only. It does not uh, give you any, any tickets uh, or uh, you know, uh, be able to play. So if the city council does want to attend as players, you have to, we just have to sign up as individual tickets. Um, the second one, uh, uh, you know, the city council did uh, provide a free sponsorship last year. Um, the next one is Stout Street Foundation. I believe this is the second or third uh, event that they typically have uh, throughout the year. This one is an event called the Art of Recovery. It's going to be at the facility in Denver, El Jebel. Um, and there's uh, quite a bit of entertainment and a sign on auction, those kind of things going on. It is September 12th, uh, a sponsorship level is $1,250 and that uh, gives the city council two tickets uh, plus recognition. And then additional tickets are $75 per person. The, uh, excuse me. All right, Kristen, what am I doing? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the third one is, uh, as I said, is a new uh, nonprofit. It is uh, entitled Bullying Recovery Resource Center. 
it, they, I believe this is actually their first uh, fundraising event. And uh, they uh, are having that in Arvada. Uh, the fundraiser, the sponsorship is $1,000 and it provides two tickets plus recognition. And then there are obviously individual tickets that are available. I, I did have, I did call the um, Gwen, who is the, the director of, of the of facility. And I was, I really was curious whether or not the uh, center actually provides um, the assistance to families and they reach out to families. And she said that they have, uh, she's the only paid member in on the organization and the other, she has two other staff people that volunteer their time and the others actually do oversee uh, lead advocates and who are also volunteers and they work directly with the families. Sometimes, you know, it's one, uh, that means a phone call or it can mean a lot longer um, interactions with the families and per primarily with schools. So that's how she described it to me. Um, so those are the the three requests. Um, I think I noted in the council communique that if um, based on the commitments that have already been approved, if all three of these are approved, we'll be slightly over the budget, uh, about two thousand dollars. So, and as I explained uh, the last time, uh, one of the things that happened is that <laughs> under the organizations actually increased their sponsorship levels by about a thousand dollars then we were not expecting that so with that i'll um i'll turn it over to you for comments and okay. direction jessica i guess the only one that i wonder about is this last one um there's nothing in adams county that has the same resource arvada i mean we don't know much about them. I, I don't know what we would be giving and who they would be benefiting in the city of Thornton, where the other ones, we did get the data back for Stout Street last year, and we know what AC Rep does. So I, I would support the first two, but I don't know anything about the last one unless somebody else does. I was gonna ask the same as far as, did they tell you if they treat families specifically from Thornton? They said that in the information they sent us that they had um, had uh, treated a family in Thornton. Okay. Uh, they've been in existence for maybe three years. So um, I think they're pretty, pretty much Denver center focused at this point. Okay. Kathy. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I would actually, I would support all three. Um, I have heard of, of the RRC. Um, I do know that they have had interactions and worked with families in, in our city and that, uh, that they are definitely, and their office or their, when you call the person at the facility, it might be the center, but it's definitely, their services are available to people across the metro area. A lot, um, as you mentioned, some of it's connecting, some of it's also um, working with families to, uh, and, and in the if it's a school situation, you know, and, and have teaching advocacy and, and offering support and things like that. And I think that, that has bullying we know impacts kids in every school, sadly. So um, I'm I'm in support of um, all three. Any other comments or questions, Tony? Uh, if we uh, support this and go over budget, uh, do you anticipate there'll be any more requests uh, for the rest of the year? I, I think there will be two more. I think Stout Street has one, uh, and there are a couple um, entities from last year that we have not heard from yet. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's two to three more. So, Chris. With this, then Stout Street looks like they'll be at about thirty-seven fifty for the year. If they were to come back with another, then I think perhaps we in a decent amount supporting them. Um, I honestly, I I hate bullying. I think that's something that that amount for a thousand maybe to help grow this program wouldn't be a bad idea. And from here, looking at the slides and what we have, we haven't done anything for AC rep. So the 500 also seems pretty small in consideration for the annual budget. Um, so I'd say I'm, I'm definitely in favor of one and three. 
if that other stop street is more beneficial or maybe they should kind of pick and choose because they're getting a, a, a decent amount of budget right now. I'm, I'm not against it by any means, but if we're just like what Councilman Underhand is saying right now, if we're looking at a budget alone uh, to try and stretch the money that we have as wide as possible, no real opposition, just one and three stand out probably more to me if we still have more coming from Stout Street down the line. Any other comments? There's a question. Go ahead. Is there a way to find out if Adams County, any of the schools have a bullying program? Because again, if, if they said that they've only treated one person or one family in Thornton, maybe there's another resource local that we can support. Uh, what Gwen did say was that uh, when I asked her if, if she had any families and she said I have, have really only served one family in Thornton, she said that to her indicates that the schools have some really strong programs. Um, that was her, what her comment was because the other thing she commented on is that they, they like to interface with the family and the school. And, and and that's kind of where they want to uh, to help people figure out how to deal with bullying. <clears throat> School is an important part of that. I mean, I don't think any of us are against supporting a program that supports those who have been bullied, but if it's local and there's something we can support, I'd rather do that than one family being supported in another city. Okay. Justin? Did you say that if we approve this, it would be 2000 over budget? About. about our, so we're right, right already, now. We're already a little bit over budget. Well, we would be with if all three of these uh, requests were approved. We'd be at 31 and our budget's 29. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't like the idea of just going over budget for the sake of it. I, I think we set a budget. We can increase our budget next year and tell them to come back next year. We've already approved $30,000 worth of, it's not like we're not contributing to them, but they could have asked us earlier. Which ones are you in All favor of? of you don't want to do any of them. Okay, okay. David. <clears throat> um. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be fine with just the first two. Again, if our schools already have a strong bullying program, there's some other program that we can help out. It just doesn't seem like that's something that it's worth contributing to based on it helping Thornton residents. So I'm fine with one and two. Okay, so what it looks like is so far, I need to hear from, Tony and Roberta. I'll support all three. All three? I'm, I'm good with all three. Okay. So um, it looks like we have a consensus then. Can you read those out for yep. the consensus? It looks one? like, so Chris was good with one and three or all three. Am I correct? Yeah, I wanted to hear what everyone said, but one and three were the primaries okay. for me. So where do you stand now? We're gonna take this budget in consideration mm -hmm. and taking care of um, our residents are more focused to it than just one. Just one? Okay, so you just won. David was one and two. Jessica, you were one and two? Yeah. But are, have we supported, we supported Stout Street in something already, right? We have, haven't we? Yes. So then yeah. have we done anything with AC Rep? No, this is their first one. Okay, so. I would support them then. Just we one? Haven't supported them yet? Okay, Dave. We want to stay in Just budget. one? Okay, so. So we have basically David, Chris and Jessica on one, Kathy, Roberta, and Tony on all three. So I will go with number one as well. So it's just number one. Yeah, Kathy. I would like to make a request that we um, 
Because I think you said we did not anticipate that some organizations are going to be in, they increase their sponsorships. Correct. I think that we should definitely anticipate that for next year. Um, I get a little bit frustrated when we start parsing out down to thirty thousand dollars about money to spread around to nonprofits that are going to help residents of our city. The BRRC has already helped a family in our city, and I think given um, what we know to be happening with bullying, as great as some of our school districts are we're only going to be unfortunately needing more of those services. So um, I would like to ensure that our request on the budget to uh, anticipate an increase in sponsorships and also requests for new nonprofits coming to us. I don't think we can just bank on what's happened in the past to build our budget. I completely agree with that. I think we need to increase our overall budget in this arena for next year. We do uh, send the individual invites out to the city council for all of those events. Just, you know, mm -hmm. this is really this about sponsorships, whether the city council. Okay. Roberta. Um, just like, it just feels like we have folks that come back a lot. And I was wondering if we could like, I don't know how it, I think you probably brought this up. <laughs> uh, yeah, or just like if we had a supported one, just kind of like shuffling them around a little bit because it's like stop streets coming back. Well, we did ask them at the beginning of the year to tell us about all of their events for the whole year. But I think what happened is that they didn't necessarily have everything planned. And so that's the problem. Um, Jessica. I wonder if there's a way to just, you know, at, I don't know what other cities do, but there must be a way to say, if you're going to ask for a sponsorship, it must happen by X. And this is the amount of money. And if you've already applied for one, priority will be given to others who haven't applied. I mean, I think it's fine that they're applying multiple times, but is the golf tournament the best bang for our buck versus mm -hmm. an actual event where we all go or the city is represented in a bigger way? It's really hard to find out what the criteria is for other cities. I've looked at them. Some uh, Aurora used to list all of the entities that they were that had been approved in the budget, and they actually didn't pay a lot of attention to that. Um, after you know, when you look at the actual expenditures, and so it, it's really difficult. Some a couple of cities I know have an application which we have now on the website, and the new uh, Bullying Recovery Resource Center did fill out, um, and and we we do provide that, but it's. Um, it's just information, so uh, it doesn't help a lot. Do you think that we could say something to the effect of, if you're going to be applying for more than one event, please note that if we approve the first event, we may not approve any further events during the year? We could absolutely do that and put that in the information materials that, that, that are on the web page, as well as inform them personally, which we'd be happy to do. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you guys think about something like that? Some sort of criteria, so when they apply, they kind of know. Yeah, I would I, think. I'm, I'm sorry, I still feel we're talking about such, I mean, I know we have to be good stewards of our resources. Um, so we need to, and, it's, and thanks for tracking the data about how many times we've given, do these, some of these organizations also receive TAC funds, all of, all of that plays into it. But, If this, if residents of Thornton have been or are being, I, I, I just, I just don't see that. Of course, you know, trying over two thousand dollars just get frustrated when I know these people are trying to are trying to build nonprofit programs to benefit people in our community. Okay, thank you. Your direction. Oh. Justin? I was just going to say, there's got to be something similar to what we do with TAF. I mean, we can't support every single person in the world. There has to be a limit. There is a budget. We can't support. We're not here to build and grow nonprofits. That's not the job of the city. So we have some criteria in place for TAF. I don't know why we wouldn't do the same for this. Why don't we have a discussion during an um, upcoming planning session where we can put some requirements around that for next year. Thank you. Um, all right, briefing number B, discussion regarding the businesses of Thornton Advisory Commission recommendation. 
Okay, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Council. Uh, so tonight I'm going to present uh, the BTAC, the Businesses of Thornton Advisory Commission's uh, recommendations for appointment and uh, looking for council's direction. So um, as a refresher from where we left off with BTAC, the council reappointed uh, two members and uh, based off of the commission's recommendation and then 14 applicants were, applications were forwarded on for an interview and recommendation from the commission. And uh, this chart shows you where we stand with the total number of positions. Uh, positions to fill is six. Um, ward distribution currently is three in ward one, two in ward two, zero in ward three, four, or two in ward four, and two members are uh, non-city um, business owners. Uh, their businesses are not within the city. And so uh, based off of the requirements, uh, we do need one person from Ward 3. And uh, based off of the interviews and the uh, recommendation, we would end at uh, five in Ward 1, two in Ward 2, one in Ward 3, four in Ward 4, and three would be um, not have a business within the city, but they are still uh, city residents. Mm -hmm. So the board is recommending the six individuals that are listed on the screen. And um, the uh, chair of BTAC is here if you have questions. Any questions? Chris? So when I kind of look at the industry categories, um, to me, it kind of, kind of pops out a little bit that the food industry is heavier. And I thought, I'd, obviously, I understand a, a brewery, but when I think of a brewery, I mean, there's the ability to eat there. It's food and beverage to some degree. It may not be a full-on operating restaurant, but the industries are broken down separately. Like, again, brewery. Food and beverage is always considered one category. Yeah, I used to work in restaurants. So, I mean, in all honesty, if you're selling just beer and you've got food trucks there or maybe just small bites, like, why why does BTEC split mm -hmm. that so finely versus maybe some of the other industries? That was me. I did that when we were going through and just trying to identify um, where people were because we had like an insurance person who was leaving and we just want to make sure that all of them were represented well. I didn't have like official um, categories that like I didn't go to the state's website or the, you know, the gov any government websites and look for official categories. I just knew from what they said that they did. And I just kind of. Okay. Well, food and beverage for your knowledge is always considered one category. Yeah. And they are. Food Best demonstrated beverage. practices. Okay. They're food and beverage. on all. But they're separated on this. Yeah. Again, like my point being, if, and just so I can, you know, see it clearly, like a brewery, fine, they're serving beer and maybe small bites occasionally. Yeah, Why I'm, not? Kind of, I'm kind of a mutt too. I, I own a financial business too, so I'm kind of a mutt. I do, I do a couple different things, but I'm known for the brewery. Okay, but yeah, I mean, like, we just have a broad construction category. There's a lot of different various types of construction. Uh, so it just keeps it simple, industry breakdown-wise, versus splitting up one of these industries. I think in the future, it could all just be under food and beverage. And if you have to come from the airside tire brewing, like that, that's fine. But you're, there's some splitting hairs there going of, of industries. And that one to me just kind of stuck out when I was reading through all this, um, why it was broken down at that point. Um, I'll let somebody else go, but I had some else. Justin was next. <clears throat> I can't remember. Did we decide that we were not interviewing board applicants ourselves? What so happened? we had decided that we were going to let the committees do the interviewing. Okay. I couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. That's why we're not interviewing. Because earlier in the year, we interviewed. I think there was some that we did. Were there some that we interviewed ourselves? Trying to recall back. I think in this round, um, all of the applicants were referred to the boards and commissions to do the interviewing. Mm -hmm. However, I will say there are some interviews coming up in the future. Um, sure. based off of just natural resignations. Yeah, as we've far had as the reappointment process, they were all referred. Okay, Jessica. Um, I just had a question actually on this. Wouldn't it just be restaurant? 
Yeah, however so you want to categorize. So I, I don't see brewery or distillery as a restaurant. We only have two breweries. We have one, I don't even think it's considered a distillery. It's just a tasting center. So I think it helps identify, uh, for me especially, we only have a small number of these. And so if they're represented or if they're hidden in restaurant, I don't know what that is. Okay, well, but I would argue with that. But I mean, we can all argue about it, but it's really not up to us to come up with these. Or if there's some other, if it's restaurant, is a restaurant considered the same as distillery or brewery? I they serve the food. That yes, that's food and beverage. And are you the expert in that? How well, actually, you... I worked in that industry, so I happen to know it's. I've that. worked in all of them myself, okay. so I'd like to see that. As have I. So that's that's why I made the suggestion that you know to the amount of food you're serving somewhat irrelevant. We, one of the recommendations is in hospitality, but it's also the same owner of Johnny's Steakhouse. So I get it some base level of the hotel, but again, it's another restaurant. And it's not like, I mean, I'm not trying to split hairs. I just want broader, like food and beverage, the beer, food, all that stuff. You're serving it. It's restaurant atmosphere, food and so beverage. So are you, are you saying that it's mostly a restaurant or mostly a brewery? Because that's two different I'm, things. I'm saying that's splitting hairs. Well, how are you They're supposed to at, identify? You okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Unless we want to sit here and have a conversation and look up what we're talking about and make those decisions and then come back to this decision tonight, then we're not gonna sit here and argue. Kathy? Thanks. So refresh me, um, please. So if somebody is designated as a representative from Ward 1, if they, does that mean that they're, that they're what, what's the category? Their business is located in Ward 1? Yes, for this uh, table, their business location. Okay, so this is by their business located with that. Okay, so, so they apply based on the location of their business. In the city. We have the information for both their residents and their business, but uh, for purposes of this, it's their business. And the requirement is one from each ward uh, because there's the additional requirements that they be, uh, we have a certain number from uh, each area of the city that we have um, a large business, a small business, uh, local ownership, public national ownership, all of the other criteria that goes into it. Sure, but what I'm saying is there, when they apply to represent say Ward 1, if I apply to represent Ward 1, that's because my business is located in Ward 1. Even if, if I live in a different part of the city or do I apply by my residence address? They're, they're applying and they're providing their residence address and their business address. Um, for purposes of ward distribution, we're looking at the business address. So we only have two businesses from Ward 2? Correct. Did we not have any other businesses from Ward 2 apply? Um, I think we may have. But um, again, it's the requirement in the bylaws is for one from each ward. And um, <clears throat> actually we did not have anyone else from ward two apply. That is on the short list here. Chris? Ward three, since they only have one and we have some that have as many as five. We have one other person from Ward 3 that applied that's not recommended. Um, we had two others that were from Ward 3, but they were no-shows to the interview. Jessica. I guess I would actually like to have the conversation about breaking these so the sections down. So can staff just bring that back so we can have a better understanding? I think we need to have we need to, we need to have a discussion and not staff, but from us, we need to make the decisions about what exactly the requirements should be for the different industries. If we're gonna be splitting it up by industries, then we need to make those decisions. And it's kind of sounding like we don't have enough people um, from wards two and three to fill these seats. Roberta? I wasn't done yet, actually. Go ahead, Mia. 
So I, I don't want to be in charge of that. We're, I'm not the expert. This is not my job telling another department to that I'm going to decide for them. I would ask the city manager then to find out or figure it out. This is not our purview. We don't decide categories for okay, the city. That's fine. I am asking Brett to bring that to us and then we will make the final decision because that is what city council does. Um, so you can bring an option to us and we can set it up by category. But what it's sounding like to me is that the recommendations we're getting don't fulfill every single ward and aren't necessarily how we need to fill the seats on BPAC. So just making sure I'm clear for, for uh, council consensus here, there would be no action as far as any reappointment for right now or appointment recommendations for right now. And so mm -hmm. there could be a further discussion by council on categories. Then. Yes, I think we need to have set categories um, as far as what counts as what. So food and beverage, what kind of other businesses are being looked at and how are they being looked at? And we also need to have a further discussion on how many per ward. I get that it says one per ward, but when we have ward two that has one and ward three that has one or two, but we have four or five from ward four, um, it, it just doesn't look like we're doing the right thing by our residents and by the city and by our businesses. I mean, our businesses deserve um, to be represented. Roberta? Um, so we don't have, we have just one representative right now, right? Two. Two. Okay. You would have two if they did. We'll the recommendation. Yeah, you've got. But there is a need for more representation for more too. Like that. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, like, is there any varied type of, like, outreach that's been done to Ward 2? Because I know, like, we were just saying offline, like, we don't have, like, a ton of businesses like brick and mortar businesses in Ward 2, just by the way it's designed. But there are varieties of other small businesses, home businesses, things like that. Just wondering if there was any other way to do outreach that might reach some folks that may not, you know, have traditionally been a touch point of contact with them. We did make multiple efforts, uh, outreach efforts to all wards, all businesses. We emailed them. Um, and I believe it may have even been on social media, at all kinds of meetings and presentations. And then we actually went and talked to businesses too and said, hey, I think you would be a great representative. And you do, you know, you're very involved and you're looking for more opportunities to be involved. So we invited them. And then that's how we got, I believe, 34 applications. And so it was a really, it was a hard process to whittle it down because they were, you know, BTEC has some strange, um, some requirements where they are like one per ward, but also you have to have one, they have to be south of 104th and, they, and then they have to be 104th to 120th, 120th to 136th, then 136th up to Highway 7. But then you also have to represent various industries, as many industries as you can, and so that was going to be one thing that we'll be talking about when we do have a full board is maybe looking at some of those requirements and simplifying them and getting the best mix of representation for the businesses in the city. Yeah, it sounds like it's a lot of different layers. Yeah. And so for the clarify again for the the categories, that was simply just for B tax knowledge to look, you know, and say, so we know that we don't have. 10 bankers or financial people or everybody wasn't from. So that was just supposed to be at a very simple level. Um, but we have four food places. Yeah. Um, Justin? Um, what? So there's, with the candidacy you're recommending, um, could you provide some of it? inside or elaborate on what are some of the qualities about these candidates that made you uh, want to recommend them? First of all, the whole hope you have to understand there's a sifting process for we have so many candidates to pour through and a lot of quality candidates, by the way, but some of them had red flags with the city, uh, tax issues or some other issues like that. So we 
we had to find some cutting points. We cut a lot of those people out. And some of them were in different sections. And unfortunately, they got cut out. Um, and then we based it on the interview. Um, we asked them, you know, four or five questions. Were they personable? Do they seem like they care? You know, some of them kind of came late to the interview. That had something to do with it, too. I mean, one person came down a mountain to <laughs> tap in on his phone to have the interview. Well, that showed something to us. It meant they really wanted to be in there because they were on a family vacation. Oh, okay. And, and so there were some things like that that were involved in the interviews that these people really stood out. I mean, they were head and shoulders above most everybody else. And we really tried to hear have everybody from every ward and by well, the bylaw or whatever it is, we could have one from each one. Sometimes there just weren't enough quality candidates by the time you went through the system to make that work. We'd love to have it equal in every ward, but it just didn't work out that way with four yeah. candidates. Um, I got confused for a second because on our packet, there's a list of questions, but it says building code advisory board questions. So did you guys get to write your own questions? No, they were actually, we get given to us and we chose from a pool of those. Oh, okay. So you, you had a list of questions and then you just found the ones that you wanted to ask. Yes, that's right. All right, that was, that's all my questions. Tell me. Uh, the uh, recommendation from Ward 3, can you tell me uh, just what kind of business that represents? David Marshall um, owns uh, Rush Bowls. And so uh, it's like, um, you know, like fruit, fruit bowls, dessert type of thing. Yep. Uh, I, uh, just listening to you and, and, and seeing what you're doing and what have you, I think you've made very good decisions and that's what we've asked you to do. So uh, I'm probably in the minority, but I completely agree with your recommendations. Thank you. Yes, the same brush bowls that won the award for your business. Okay. Yeah. That might have helped you then. It I actually won the award. <laughs> it was never discussed. Oh, so I don't know how I don't know how they I sat in on the interviews. Yeah. Though. Oh, that's where I recognize I, I think I've met him before. Cool. Yeah, since your brother David, he's the guy who came all the way down from the mountain. Oh, really? To take okay. the phone call. And he really he's involved in so many ribbon cuttings out there. He cares about the city, the community. Um, I've gotten to know him. I think he's fantastic. I think he's really, even though he, if you feel he's overweighted in the food and beverage industry, he has a background in something else too. That's just something. You know. yeah. I just think if you're going to have, if you're going to allow more than three from one industry or more than two, then you should be looking at that in other industries as well. And you, it was very clear that you did not do that. Uh, it is not. That is not true. Okay, well, I have some inside information that says otherwise. That's Kathy? That, that's, we, 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 Todd, we'll right. talk. My, my, mm -hmm. question, my question is, is um, VTAC exempt from our, our policy on equal ward representation? Yeah, it's the that. one per ward, it's what the requirement is for the VTAC because of the other requirements that are included. So it's only, okay, so when the requirement is only one per, then how, and how many people are on VTAC? Uh, I think it's like 15, uh, maximum of 15. Yeah, no, I do have, so I, I do have a concern about, about the balance and I, I, and I, and I, and I do understand that it's, that this is, that VTAC is a little bit of a different animal than some of the other uh, boards and commissions, I would say. So but I'm just expressing concern about that and, and also whether or not the, the industry, I mean, I understand you're trying to balance. Yeah, it's it, it's a lot to try to balance different industries and make sure we're, we're telling all of those, uh, all the interests. Um, so I just, you know, there are some things that kind of are a little concerning to me in there that when people turn down because of their industry, even though they were a good candidate, or they a better candidate than somebody who's from a different industry, it's just hard. It's a lot to take. In, it's a lot to take into account. So I will yield the floor and let somebody else speak right now. I just wanted to raise my share my concerns. Jessica, um, I guess uh, looking at this breakdown, there's six people that were new to appoint, and then two that we would reappoint. I I don't agree with not doing anything. I think we have to follow the process. And it sounds like you're working on this process. I think maybe after the board is complete, I would want to see like a map even of how you said you broke it down because that would be a visual. It's hard to understand with all these different criteria that you're using, but maybe the mapping. Obviously, Ward 2, we don't have 
the number of businesses. So it's going to be much more challenging to fill, especially five or even, you know, three for that matter. Ward three will have more businesses as they grow. So I anticipate they will end up with more down the road. Ward four and ward one have the most businesses. So it makes sense. Um, I'm looking through this and I don't really see any inequality in one over the other. So if there's some inside information, I think we should all know what that is because it's hard to make a decision if only one person has that information. So I would agree with Tony that we can't do nothing. Otherwise that leaves the board in a very bad position, especially when two people need to be reappointed to the board. Just for clarification, the two people have been reappointed. Okay. That is done. So it's the That's six. good to know. I would still move forward because we didn't stop with any of the other um, commissions. We allowed that to move forward and said we would continue working on balancing out as we moved on. I would, I would support the same thing and agree with Tony. Can I ask a clarifying question? Are you, I have probably the information that you're looking for in a spreadsheet. Are you looking for the people that we interviewed and then how they were broken out? Or like your actual breakdown? Five? Like if you said you have south of this end and north of this and between here, even just a map to see sort of what, who is in each of those and what industry, I'm just a visual person. So the spreadsheet helps to see the categories, but it might be helpful to see on the map how you broke it down is what I think it should have been on this slide. What industry they were with? It's in our packet though. It, it's no, it should have been in front of us. That's fine. Gotcha. I provided everything that I had to the clerk's office, so I wasn't. I'm not sure. I think that in the future, my request would be that that's the information that is shown to us on the slides, because when we're trying to decide what ward they're from, what kind of business they're in. This That's isn't giving us the whole story. Like it. It's in the packet. Okay. I've read the packet. I'm just asking for it to be in the slides that are presented to us. Does anybody else want to make a decision about what they'd like to see us do here? I think this might be the information you're looking for. Thank you. So right now we've got Jessica and Tony that want to move forward. Um, anybody else want to give their opinion on what they'd like to do? David? Just looking at the recommended people, and I see the two food people from the industry. The rest is hospitality, hospitality marketing, and auto repair. You know, I know, understand. I understand there's only one person from Ward 3 that's recommended, but the other two failed to show up. Is, that's my understanding. So it's hard to interview people that don't show up. So at this point, I'm fine with the, approving the recommendation. Well, it's not giving you the whole story here either, though, as far as to food, because it's not showing us who's already on. I understand. So I just want to point that out. There's only one current member who's in the Okay. Who else wants to? We're not at consensus yet. So, does anybody else want to vote to do that? To move forward or to give another opinion? Well, I've shared my concerns over more distribution, which again, Acknowledging that that this is that that we're looking at business representation that's impacted by the number of, of business businesses per ward, I you know would like to see more balance in that. Um, if that's just that, that if that's at all possible, um, I don't I don't really want to hold up B tax work. Um, the people who were not, I guess here's my, always my question is the people who were not, who are not being appointed, um, what is the, 
what, what's the invitation? How do we work to engage them to either apply again in the future or just or, or get active with in the city with our small business organization? There was a follow up that went out to them, um, informing them that they were not chosen to or they were not recommended for appointment. However, um, here's the link to keep an eye on other opportunities. Um, we would love to see you at our business networking events, and they were sent a link to our website, sent a link to the center, and um, so they were sent more information with an invitation that we'd love to see them again in some other capacity. Thank you for that. I guess I'm okay with you. Okay, Justin, Roberta, and Chris. Um, I express my concerns about Ward 2, and I know that there's, I don't know, you know, if there's business owners that are maybe less traditional, if we can reach out to them in Ward 2, just because I know that we have, we don't have a big stronghold of brick and mortar businesses in, in Ward 2, but I do know people who own small businesses out of their homes and things like that, so um, just something to think about. Yeah, entrepreneur home entrepreneur, yeah. Um, Outreach probably is more challenging, so that's yeah. something we work at striving to get better at. Um, yeah, as you I, know, I mean, I can think of like, just a little handful of folks I know just to, you know, have businesses out of their home and things like that. So that could just be something that's maybe untapped. I don't know how we tap into it, but but other than that, I mean, you know, again, like I think with what everybody else is saying, like working with the, the, um, board's recommendation but if we can improve upon this and make sure that we have all these different layers upon layers of qualifiers kind of mapped out ahead of time that's just helpful okay so you're good moving forward too and we are moving forward with the recommendations from BTEC, and then we also want to have a discussion for future um, interviews so that we would be able to discuss what those categories are, how many we want per category, how many per ward, et cetera. So that'll be what we do moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is our update on code compliance and implementation of administrative civil penalties of certain code violations. Good evening, Council. Hi. Uh, my planning director with me is Randy Grant, City Development Director, and uh, Mike Hinkinson, our Code Compliance Manager. So the purpose of this meeting is to give Council an update. Uh, as you're aware, we've done numerous code amendments uh, this past six months or so. Uh, so we'll be talking about administrative penalties and civil processes civil penalty issued, the number of actual citations that we've issued since we implemented the, the codes, parking citations that have been issued, and then update on abandoned shopping carts. So just a reminder, for, we're going to talk about civil penalties first. Just a reminder, council adopted uh, the ordinance back in March. Uh, officers do issue notices and assess civil penalties to comply and give property owners generally a maximum 10 days to comply. If they're, if they're in compliance, any fines are waived. If uh, not corrected, fines are issued. Um, individuals have seven days to appeal the violation uh, to a hearing officer. I'm gonna hand it over to Mike Hinkinson. To, he's gonna go over the fines and then kind of talk about where we're at with stats going moving forward at this point. Good evening, sir. Um, you see the number of the costs for the, each fine, 151st violation, 502nd violation within 12 months, and thousand third for each violation thereafter within the 12 months and that's the same violation um, so right now several of these citations that have been issued have multiple 150 dollars fines because there's multiple violations on that property and then so if they're not paid within the 10 days that they have the right to appeal or apply hearing scheduled late fees are assessed um, administrative fees up to 10 percent and then it goes to collection there becomes a lien on that property um, and we do actively put liens on properties now if we conduct an abatement and it's not paid Within the 30 days time frame, it goes um, to a lien at the end of the year. So, and the last one here, and this is what I'll speak a little bit more about as well, but we do strive to work with residents, give them all the time that they need to bring the property into compliance because 
money could be a factor, time could be a factor, they could be on a vacation, what have you. So we do try to work with people and even, even if they need assistance, we'll get with um, community connections and code cap and use what resources we can. So civil companies, we started June 14th, um, that number from June 14th to the 24th, the 234 notice issue is actually um, 434 notices issued. Yeah. As that was for that week, a week and a half. Um, I was actually out when the numbers were provided, so I apologize, but I need the vacation. Um, so that was 434 notices issued from the 14th to 24th. Um, at the time, no fines were issued um, on the, by the 24th. Do just do the time frame for the seven to 10 days to comply and then any extensions that were granted. As of today, so from June 24th to today, 517 notices were issued. Uh, we have four administrative fines as of yesterday morning that had been issued um, at a $900 um, fees that were assessed on those properties. Um, and then there's, we have not received any appeals as of yet, but we have um, scheduled multiple blight hearings for that appeal process to give them their due process to come into compliance or show up to court and pay the fine and tell the judge why you're not paying or not complying. Um, so, and I did reach out to staff and ask them kind of what the residents are taking. There, one individual told me he's probably about an 80% compliance rate. Another 15% are calling and asking for more time or just trying to figure it out. Um, some people have called our admin staff and said, I'm, how do I pay? I'm not complying. So obviously we'll deal with those as we go. Um, but it is seems to more compliance people are calling, complying faster because they see the numbers on those. So, and I want to pr provide you guys this, because you all will probably see this from residents going, why am I receiving this? But on the left side is our new notice of violations that we created that spe spells it out that you will be fined if you do not correct this violation and spells out the fine, how much you'll be fined per violation if you have multiple. And then at the bottom, it'll say total penalties that you could receive. And then all the contact information for our office and the officer that left the notice is on there. Uh, on the right side is the administrative citation that we created. Um, so all the inf owner information, property information, officer information, and each code violation. And then it goes into total amount per each violation as well. And then it tells them how to appeal on the bottom if they choose to appeal or if they blight hearing the schedule and what to do and how to go forward. Are there any questions on that? Parking citations. So Dr. back in January, it took us some time to get some training from PD. Uh, so to, from that date till now, we've dealt with 2,083 vehicle violations. And then in the last two weeks, it's been 129. Um, 21 total parking tickets have been issued at a total fine of $1,070. But we've also conducted 72 impounds of vehicles that in violation uh, to the rights of the They might bring this email counsel your up-to-date numbers to today. Since everything's different from the slides here. I, I can do that. Thank you. you write that down. So, and, um, so this is just for um, visualization. This is a current parking ticket in municipal court summons that we use. Um, this will be good probably through the mid end of the year. And then partnering with PD now to do an e-ticket system, which everything would be printed and just placed in the car and sent directly to courts. Um, to streamline that process now stop us from walking everything over to courts and risk losing paperwork and information and everything else. Banning shopping carts. So May 28th, it was approved the 29th I, or shortly thereafter, I had the RFP posted, bids stopped on the 28th and we received three proposals. And we hope to interview well, July 15th. Um, there was three dates we were given, but we're hoping to get July 15th to get those in, interview two of the candidates or two of the businesses, and then go forth with, get them on, sign them on and move forward. Um, and then that information will be presented or emailed out for that. Because one of the companies does have, um, similar to my Thornton for complaints, the ability to go in, drop pins and tell them where they're at so they can go and pick these carts up and take them back. That'd be great. When do you... If you do the interviews on the 15th, when do you think we could have them actually in place? Probably we'd probably take a couple of weeks um, to get just the paperwork process, legal review and approval, and then 
get it out. But I, I hope by the end of July we can get it on the boots on the ground. That'll be fantastic. Thank you. It's lofty goal. <laughs> So we are scheduled to come back in August and update all this information. So hopefully we got a lot more information and feedback to provide. And if there's any questions in the meantime, obviously we can judge those. Any questions? Kathy? Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, those are some good numbers. That's, that's a lot. And I, I know um, residents are part have been anxious for to see some of the, the street, the, the box trucks and the other parking issues of the rest and, and we appreciate that. My the other question I get from people that are concerned is how if their neighbors out of compliance, well they always want to know how, how to contact, you know, what's what's the best way to contact. So usually I use so what, what's the best way for a neighbor just to contact code directly. Either going through the My Thornton app, okay. or they can just email code at thorntonco.gov. Okay. I mean, that goes straight to our app, and there's probably five or six of us that actually receive those emails, and then it gets disseminated. Okay. And the other thing people always want is that they want their neighbors to know what what the code says now, so that you know, so some people don't know that we've changed the code. And so, what what steps? Uh, I think I asked this before, but so what steps are we taking to make sure? They were communicating that. I mean, I know we have a community meeting coming up um, August 8th. I, you know, I don't know if, if we can just kind of throw out just to let people know, hey, things have changed. Here's where you can find the information or have some flyers that night that we can hand out so for people who do come in person because those conversations do kind of ripple through your neighborhoods. It doesn't reach every person in the city, but a lot of neighbors we just want their neighbors to know what the code is, and that doesn't mean everybody's going to comply, but there, there's senator, there is a percentage of people who just don't know if they're told, then it, you know, without without having to get a code violation notice, you know, will will self correct. So um, I just would like to support any any and all communication we can to get that out there, and that, and to also to communicate that we are enforcing it. Uh, so it's not just hey, the code's changed, but it's, our enforcement is changing along with it, and and again, like you're saying, more streamlined efficient way to get that information with the e-tickets or, you know, so that the information is getting to the municipal court as, you know, in a more speedier fashion. All of that, I think that people, because I, I think it's really, it's about just letting people know we're doing this and we're serious and people want their neighborhoods to look better and I think they will be happy about this. Not everybody who gets a violation notice is going to be happy, but I think the goal is that we want our neighborhoods to be more well-maintained and that we're taking active steps to do that. And that's the message that I want to make sure we're getting out there. That's not, we're not out there to get people trying to make our neighborhoods cleaner and safer. So thank you for your work. Jessica? I was going to say, whatever you guys have been doing have seen like significant turnaround. There was that one house that we drove by. It was just, I mean, I can't believe what I saw in the backyard, but after um, we submitted that, it was within a week. It was cleaned up. So I really appreciate the work that's gone into this. Um, I wanted to be happy about the part because I know you did that, but I can't get into my app again. It's got the please sign in problem that I get pretty regularly. So what? You downloaded your version. You download what? Update the version of your app. Yeah, it happens all the time. That's the problem. It's hard to go in and just click the button. And then it just, I, I don't know, IT said if this happens again to let them know. So I'm letting you know, whoever I should, wherever you are. Uh, Justin. Oh yeah, I just wanted to, you know, compliment Go Team for doing a great job. I've noticed, you know, I've had positive feedback from residents. And I personally have had quick responses when I, uh, notices of, of violations and and I think that it sounds like the tools that we're providing you are helping well so you guys are doing a great job so thank you Tony uh, are all these violations uh, uh, initiated by an outside party or is there some action that the code enforcement folks are taking on their own when they notice a violation and initiate those or uh, a, a, a feel for which side is more uh, there? It's it's both. Um, 
we, 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 we strive for like an 80% proactive approach where the officers are driving around the neighborhood, finding the violations and relying on residents 20% of the time. Um, and that's what we're trying to maintain and get stay at that level. Um, I would say, I could pull that up. Mike, can you also briefly mention your uh, code enforcement hours? It's not just you know nine to five business hours. It's right. So yeah, I do have staff. Some staff work for like seven to four, um, eight to five. Then there's people on um, on week on Saturdays doing whatever necessary that comes in after hour complaints regarding businesses, prohibited vehicles, food trucks. Lately, I mean anything out of the ordinary that we usually don't catch during the week. And also we do um, night inspections as required. Um, for lighting issues, and then we usually do lighting inspections in the fall and winter of all uh, non non residential properties. Make sure lights are on and they're all working properly and everything's set. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. I was thank you for bringing that up. I was just going to say, yeah, the the biggest time the time where the issue are after five and on on weekends. And we, you know, I definitely see that in my neighborhood. And so, if we could um, have more evening, uh, up, you know, up till under, I mean, up to like eight o'clock, if somebody, or even just till seven, if you know, if, if if there was a shift, because I think you'd see a lot of it, by right? a lot, a lot more things by seven o'clock, and um, in, in the evening. But, you know, I'm, you, I, it, that's you're the expert on scheduling your staff. I was saying <laughs> by seven, I think. The neighborhoods look very different than they do at four or five. That's just my two cents on that. All right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate yeah. your presentation. Oh, oh, sorry, Roberta. Oh, yeah. Um, Council Member Ryan. So, out of 5,000 violations, only 1,000 of them have been reported or called in from the resident. So, I mean, that, and that's not updated. That was only through mid June. So, I'll update those and I can add it to the communication that you want to send out. I'll put that information as well. Good information. And thanks for uh, all the work that your folks are doing. So that's 4,000 or more that you guys are getting? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Roberta? Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Kathy, Kathy said. Um, like I saw in Wood Glen, we, we drove through and it was not so bad, but like after five, there was like giant trucks. Uh, on the road. So I know it's like late and I hate to give people the late shift, but it's really what's happening is like folks get off work and they park like their box trucks. Um, I walked in Burnhood a couple weeks ago and there was just like food trucks all over the street and stuff. So, and that was in Grange Creek. So it's, you know, board two, there's just a lot of, a lot of them and they just don't know yet about the rules and all that. So they're parking them in the streets. Right. And with the oversized vehicle permit process that, um, we also was approved. We were working on the education, like the education piece on that, and letting all those people know, like, hey, you can't do this anymore. You have to come in and do this. Uh -huh. um, and there's only a couple so far that are in that process. Okay. And there's some others that have to basically get a um, building permit and create parking space on their property to be able to attain the permit in the first place. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's going to be tough, and and I know it's going to take some time, but I, I just I'm curious, like, how many people even know? Because there's like this green space over there in Wood Glen where it's just like a street and they're not supposed to park there either, right? Like if it's just a, an open like grass easement, they're parking box tracks along that. And then over there by that park, they're parking them like semi-type trucks on that too. So, and residents complain about that. So I just thought I'd bring it up. Cause I mean, it's, it's after hours, it's not during the work day. Anything else? All right, well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, does anybody have any board or commission updates? Nope, anybody help? Any other business? I do. Hey, Robert. I'd like to ask that um, in maybe our upcoming, one of our upcoming planning sessions, um, that we look into um, a uh, employee assistance fund, and it wouldn't be funded by the city. It'd be something that we could have where employees could fu fund it for themselves. And there's a couple of different um, examples, like the state of Colorado has one for their employees, and 
companies like, for example, Starbucks have it. So it's basically, this is coming from, you know, the whole situation with the, uh, the car shooting and the shooting that happened at Carpenter. But as the city grows and gets larger, um, we're, you know, going to potentially have more issues where folks are in these situations where either it's a tragedy personally or things like this that happen with gun violence or whatever it might be. And it's not something that we would fund, again, with tax dollars. It would be something that would be funded by the employees for the employees. And in the case of the Colorado specific one, there's a grant that also helps fund it. But um, it would take some um, research from our city staff, who at whichever department, to look into that and see exactly how that's managed and how we could um, make sure that happens, that it would be something that would be again, just funded by employees for employees. It's kind of the idea of passing the hat when people are in a bad situation. So I would just like to ask if we could get consensus to put that on a planning session and have some research done to build that for our employees. Jessica. I would support that. We had something like that when I was teaching called the Sunshine Fund. So I think that's helpful when you have certain things come yeah. up. And, and I was acutely yeah. like that. Sorry, what's called a cop. And maybe we already have something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Kathy? Yeah, I, I support, yeah, the support exploring that. Definitely. Justin. Yeah, I think that I would love to learn more about what some of the best practices are and hear mm -hmm. the research on that. And I think that uh, you know it's a something that our staff can really benefit from. So, yeah. Agree. I think we all are in agreement with that. That's mm -hmm. something that our staff really needs. So let's let's do that, please. Well, it's on the schedule. Approaching fifteen hundred employees in the city. Uh, Eleven hundred full time, sixteen hundred with all the part time. So, mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody have anything else? Okay, then we're taking a break till seven.